Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the third webinar from a three-part learning series on empowering women in IPM as part of the ASEAN Paul Worm Action Plan, uh, Women as IPM Leaders Program. My name is Alison and I'll be your moderator for today along with Leandra. We have three wonderful speakers uh, joining us today to talk about gender and communication uh, and I'm really excited because as you know, I always get a sneak preview of all the presentations uh, and they're fantastic and they're also very diverse. So they're going to bring very uh, interesting and different perspectives to this really important topic on gender and communication. Now, before I move on to the next slides, I'd just like to thank everyone who's been supporting this program and in particular, uh, our financial supporters, Australian government through the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, uh, CSIRO as the host of the Secretariat for the ASEAN Fall Women Action Plan and our many other uh, partners and, and colleagues out there who've been participating in this program. Now, a few housekeeping rules before we get started. Um, there's not really much to learn now because you're all really um, technical wizards and, and huge amount of experience online. The key thing is if you could put your questions in the Q&A box, that would be really helpful. If you could rename yourself, um, you can just do that by pressing the um, more um, you, and then you look, can put your name and organization if possible uh, under the sort of participants list and please use the chat as much as possible because there's not there's not the 38 in the room will probably have more joining us uh, a little bit later but that would be a really good opportunity to talk as much as we can and to get your feedback and ask as many questions as you can what we have what we see is that a lot of people go back and watch the videos and um, we actually share and synthesize some of the discussions Discussion that we're having in the chat as well. So it would be really good to get that network um, up and running. So don't be shy. Right, um, this is part three now. It's the final um, session of a three part series. We've discussed gender roles and mango crops uh, in September, bananas on the 25th of October. Today, we're completing this series by looking at the role of gender in the way we communicate. And finally, just to bring to your attention, we'll be having this conference on women empowerment and integrated pest management from the 6th to the 8th uh, of December. And if you would like to attend, uh, you can do so. And just on the next page, I'm going to just explain that there will be three days from 6th to the 8th. Two and a half uh, of those days will be around a specialised gender training and research skills course uh, for researchers and, and policy makers and anyone really interested in understanding um, how do you start thinking about this, how do you design your research or your projects to consider the importance of gender, what kind of things can you um, take into account and how can you shape uh, your projects um, with this gender lens. Uh, uh, in sort of the front of your brain as well. So that will be two and a half days. Um, actually, we will consider sponsorship for attendance to that. So if you feel like you would like to come, but you don't have the financial resources to, please email me because um, we do have that sponsorship and we're really keen to get lots of people across Southeast Asia and in some cases, wider parts of the, the, the world. <laughs> outside Southeast Asia, particularly if you're working in Southeast Asia, uh, really keen to get a really good group of motivated, excited and um, inspirational people together to talk about that. The first day we're going to have a half day online sort of physical uh, hybrid event. So all those people will participate uh, in the room, but we'll also have an online um, element so that we have um, some keynote speakers bringing together and really setting the platform for that, that week of activities. And that'll be between um, two to four in Vietnam time on the 6th of December. So really exciting. If you're interested, please just um, email me and tell me that you're interested. Tell me a bit about yourself and what you're working on as well, because that gives me a bit of an idea of who you are and, and where you could fit into the conference. So that brings us up to the agenda today. It is... Um, three very cool, very fantastically interesting speakers who have got really different perspectives. We're going to be talking about information networks for gender sensitive climate smart agriculture, gender analysis on communication and uptake of trigger grammar, and then we're going to end with unlocking women's power by enhancing communication skills. So um, I'm really excited to hear what that's all going to be about and we're going to have plenty of time for questions 
as well. So keep them coming, many of them. Let's challenge our speakers as much as we challenge ourselves in the room and putting them in the hot seat. Um, before we start, I thought I would just have a little bit of a poll and I'm going to launch it now. And look, it's not we're not we're not keeping a um, tabs on who's answering what and how. It's just to get people thinking. You should be able to see the poll now. And the first question is: Do men and women communicate differently? The second question: Can you see that, Leandra? Oh, look, we can yes, see answers. It's, yeah, we can see them. Um, we can see the poll. Oh, cool. No, no, it just took a little while for anything to come up. I think it's a bit slow, the system on my end, so I'm sorry about that. Um, I'm interested to see what people say. Um, do you explicitly consider the role gender might play in your research and or work projects? Um, can you think of an example in your own work research experience where women and men communicated in different ways on the same subject? So this is not meant to be a scientific uh, poll. Uh, we won't be recording this forever. It's just to get us warmed up. And let's see if we can get 20 spent. We've got 41 people in the room now, so that's excellent. And I'm going to close it soon. So we've got 53% participated. If you can, get in there now, answer the questions. <laughs> Don't don't be shy. We don't even we don't know who's answering what. I know that if you're on a phone, sometimes this you can't always um, do this. Um, so you can always share your answer in the chat if you have one. And I'm going to end it very soon. And I'm going to end it. Oh, excellent! We just got one more person. I'm going to end it now. I'm going to share the results. And um, I'm going to get the speakers to think about this when they're talking about it. Do men and women communicate differently? This is kind of interesting. Yes, it depends, which is kind of like a yes. <laughs> and no, 10%. I'm really interested in this one. Um, maybe you can share your views. Um, that, that, that would be good. Um, for number two, do you explicitly consider the role gender might play in your research and, and or work projects? I think this is fantastic. 80% have said yes. Um, so that's actually really interesting and I think maybe even quite high. So it just shows that we're, at, we're actually starting to think about that more because I'm sure there was a time when we weren't really thinking about that as much as we should. And I can see some nodding there from Go Mathy. I'm not sure if she's agreeing with me, but Maybe she'll she'll talk about that at the end of her presentation, I'm sure. The third one, I thought this was interesting. Can you think of any example in your own work research experience where men and women communicated in different ways on the same subject? We've got 77% said yes. And what I'm quite keen is if you said yes, and you have got an example, if you can give us a brief example in the chat, um, that would actually be great. So there's my there's my task for you. It would be interesting to know if you've got a really short example, feel free to put it in. No is kind of interesting too. Um, so kind of share your thoughts on that if you have time in the chat. Right, we've got warmed up. We've got quite a few more people in the room. We're up at 48. So we're on to uh, our first uh, fantastic speaker of the top three speakers here. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm very excited because we've got Rachel Friedman speaking on networking for gender equitable climate smart agriculture information networks. Um, we have next up after that Bethel Tarif speaking on gender analysis on the use of trichogram of biocontrol methods. Uh, and then we have Gomathy Palanapan from the University of Queensland speaking about the perceptions of women farmers in the Philippines uh, and I'm communicating with buyers. So um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Rachel. I'm going to hand you the um, hand you the ability to uh, load your presentation. So I'm going to stop share. And you might just have to unmute yourself there as well. It's looking good. I just can't hear you, Rachel. There we go. Oh, can. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> 
Thank you for that lovely introduction, Alison. Um, and as you said, my name is Rachel Friedman. I'm um, a researcher at the Australian National University's Institute for Climate, Energy and Disaster Solutions. And well, it's evening for me. So this evening, I'll be sharing a bit of insight from a project that we're currently still working on in Papua New Guinea. And this particular portion looks at the information networks that account for gender and sharing climate smart agriculture information. So let's see if I can move this forward. Oops, that's too far. So just to set the scene, uh, as we're, we are probably all aware increasingly that climate change is a major issue. We've been hit by floods and drought and fire, heat waves and the unexpected cold snaps. But farmers particularly feel climate change quite acutely not just these extreme events that seem to make headlines, but the subtle shifts in temperature and the gradual creep of seasonal changes that are expected with increasingly with climate change. Now, information access is considered a crucial tool for farmers to adapt their practices to these changing climatic conditions. And except for maybe the technologically astute um, farmers, most climate science is not very accessible um, or it doesn't really uh, have much relevance or context that farmers might need to actually use it and apply it to their day-to-day -day practices. So one of the tools that we can use to help understand how to actually share information in a useful way with farmers and translate between the climate information we have and actual um, advice that farmers can apply in practice is network analysis. And network approaches are used to examine the interactions between different entities. So that can be anything from uh, groups of people to individuals to um, sources of information and individual farmers. And it can give us some insight into how influential different um, entities are. So other studies have used networks to target climate and agricultural information in a variety of settings. Um, we have particular ones that look at who might be influential uh, sources of information within farmer networks. But a lot of these studies focus on farmer to farmer exchanges. So who gives information to whom, who receives it from whom, uh, et cetera. For today's presentation and the study that I'm going to focus on actually looks beyond this to uh, understand external sources of information that infiltrate into farming communities. And I'll get back to that when I talk about the study. Just one more sort of stage setting is why, and I'm sure this is quite sort of a topic on everyone's mind for this session, is why information's needs might differ by gender. So why are we even talking about gender in terms of information and communication? And particularly in farming, women and men often have different roles, needs, or constraints in farming systems. Uh, in relation to climate change, gender is also considered a key factor that influences level of vulnerability, uh, particularly in the ability to adapt to climate change. As a way to tie in networks in terms of gender equity, networks have been used to understand different inequities within access to information. So for instance, this study by Huang et al. in 2006 found that things like political status or um, sort of importance within a community had a lot of influence on who could access training uh, to gain information in their farming practices. So these tools, have, these network tools have already been shown to be quite useful in pointing out these inequities in terms of information access and use. So with that as the foreground, I'll come to the study I'll be talking about. It will hopefully give us some insight and a good starting point for the rest of this session. So in terms of this project in Papua New Guinea, we used networks as a baseline to understand how information moves in farming communities and particularly climate and weather information. Um, I'll talk about three different aspects of the study. 
for one, how the networks differed for men and women, how these different networks reflect the different roles men and women play in the network, and then how networks might overcome some barriers that were raised by respondents in this study. And finally, I'll just allude to how we're applying these findings in practice, which I'm sure is probably the most <laughs> interesting for everyone in this, on this um, call. So we're currently doing a project in Papua New Guinea, and Papua New Guinea presents a really interesting case study uh, to look at climate information services. So the provision of things like seasonal climate forecasts and agricultural advisories to farmers, um, but also with a gender lens. And I'll come back to this in a second. So agriculture is a really important sector in Papua New Guinea, both in terms of food gardens for subsistence, as well as cash crops, particularly coffee, cocoa, and um, oil palm increasingly. Um, men and women tend to be involved in all agricultural activities, but they tend to have focuses on different and complementary roles. So women tend to be the ones in charge of these food gardens, whereas men tend to be in charge of cash crops and also tend to be the ones who undertake some of the heavier tasks like building fences and um, plowing fields, whereas women are often involved in the harvest and marketing aspects. So while everyone's involved in sort of all aspects, they tend to have more responsibilities in different spheres of the sector. Culturally, there are quite distinct barriers for women in Papua New Guinea society. And this does vary, it's quite a diverse country, both uh, in terms of the biomes as well as culture. But generally, uh, there are um, barriers that women face in terms of the control over income, access to resources, including money and information, as well as entrenched cultural beliefs about where they should be when. <laughs> So all of these put together make it really important to consider gender when we design climate information services, if we actually want uh, the information access and use to be equitable across both men and women. We worked in three different provinces in Papua New Guinea that sort of span different ecosystems or sort of biomes, um, East New Britain, uh, Morobe and Eastern Highland Province, and they're just noted on this map. And we conducted a household survey uh, using a randomized sample within these areas and uh, had approximately even numbers of men and women. And these questions serve to uh, gather information about where uh, farmers receive information, who they give information to, and how frequently how useful that information is, as well as these, any barriers that they face in acquiring or using this information. And these questions then serve to uh, form the basis for creating the network. And I'll explain, uh, maybe I'll just explain quickly what the network represents. So um, the, uh, the sort of entities within this network are individual farmers, um, both men and women, and the sources of information. So that could be anything from friends and family to agricultural extension agents to things like church groups. And then what links those different entities together is the flow of information. So the first result I'll talk about is just receiving information. So the red here is in, is representing women's network, women's side of the network, and the yellow represents men's side of the network. And while there's some crossover, you can see there's quite a strong distinction between where men and women receive their information from. So women tend to more frequently get information from informal sources, such as friends and family, or through church groups, whereas men more frequently get uh, information from formal sources like media, so newspapers, radio, et cetera, as well as leaders, so community leaders, and agricultural and government groups, so the extension side of things. And when we sort of add a weighting element to this by how useful 
farmers thought that the information was. This just reinforces what we see in this picture. So we're seeing right a strong division between receiving information from informal sources for women and formal sources for men. <clears throat> now, if we look at where in, um, farmers both receive and then give information, we get a, a different understanding of, or a sort of additional understanding of the roles women and men play within their information sharing network. So women have these, tend to form these close knit uh, ties where, where they receive information from the same places that they give information to. So these sort of tight knit networks where they pass information around. Men on the other hand, tend to act sort of as a bridging uh, uh, role where they receive information from one entity and then give it to another. For instance, men more likely get information from media sources and then they tend to give information say to friends and family. This will be quite important when I talk about the implications. Finally, we looked at the barriers that men and women uh, said that they face in terms of accessing and using information. And while you can see from this that uh, sort of the primary barrier is just frequency, people don't get information very often from <laughs> outside sources. Um, there are, for the other barriers, there are some gender splits. So men are more likely to say that the relevance of the information and the understandability of the information is a barrier for them to access and use it. Whereas women point to things like quality of information and trust. So getting to more of these intangible, the legitimacy of the information they're getting and whether it's, it's built these sort of trustful relationships with them. So what does this all mean? What can we take away from this exercise? Well, for one, uh, a fair bit of literature, particularly in this network space, has uh, pointed to the role of these connectors or bridging roles um, in extending information. So in this case, men get might get important information from media or formal sources, but then they serve as a bridging uh, role to bring information to less formal sources, such as friends and family. So they might be a way for external information to make its way into the community. One thing to keep in mind there is that there can be some loss of um, information or loss of interpretation when you go, when you have these, these sort of steps removed from the original source. And so one of the things in uh, trying to build some robust climate information services is ensuring that those people who are then going to pass information on really understand what they're getting um, from the sort of primary sources. The second thing that came out of this study that we're taking quite to heart is that, um, particularly for women, the church is a critical hub for, for getting information and building these sort of close-knit trust building uh, sort of uh, connections. In that sense, it's really important that these groups that form pivotal information sources actually get adequate training to uh, interpret the information and pass it on. So this can be an area for further development of um, by the government or by NGOs or CBOs to actually provide training to groups that uh, women tend to get information from. And finally, uh, it was pretty clear that social capital and these close-knit ties is quite important for women to build um, trust in their information uh, networks. And so um, trying to, to foster those connections can be quite important for actually, um, for, for women to be able to use this information. So, I'll end with a couple of future directions because there are obviously gaps within the study, but also noting that we're, we're currently in the process of designing a seasonal climate, well, using seasonal climate forecasts to design seasonal farm advisories. And so this sort of baseline network study is being 
incorporated into our design of that farm advisory and the rollout. So we're targeting church groups and radio, as well as um, other sort of less formal sources to actually make sure that what we've designed is useful and gets to the people who need it. So I'll just send in a couple of future directions. This survey was done at one point in time, it's just a snapshot. So one of the things that would be useful to know is do these information flows change? And are different actors influential at different times of year for different seasons, for different crops? So there's more nuance that can be built into this sort of baseline understanding. And finally, if we make changes, if we introduce this seasonal farm advisory, how does this change the network? So if more formal information sources actually target women, do their, do their relationships change? Do we start to see more bridging? Do we start to see uh, just um, stronger close-knit ties um, and this trust building? So it'll be interesting uh, well, what I would like to do, we'll see if it can actually happen, is to, is to redo the survey after we've, we've rolled out this seasonal farm advisory to see how targeting the information actually shifts the network. So with that, I'll just say there were lots of people involved in making this happen. We have a bunch of um, partners in Papua New Guinea that are um, integral to actually making this happen. And I'm just a talking piece. I'm just a spokeswoman for all of this. Um, there is a paper that's available, and if you can't access it, just uh, drop me an email and I can send you a copy. So maybe I'll um, end on that note and um, ask if there are any questions. Great. Thanks, Rachel. Um, if anyone has any questions, please put them in the Q&A. And that was fantastic. Um, I was really interested in your future directions questions too, because it, it just, you start doing this research and then all of a sudden you think, oh, but what would happen if this or this or what about this? And one question I have is how, um, how context specific is this type of analysis? I mean, this is in a particular community with a particular culture. Um, do you have to do this? Would it be the same in, if we did this in Malaysia or Vietnam, or would you be expecting potentially quite a big difference? Or what's your sort of thought thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think I think there would be some similarities. Um, there's 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 not a huge amount of literature that's looked at um, information networks and gender together. Yeah. Um, in the farming context, like all three of those things. Um, so I would imagine that some you get like general common themes around differentiation between men and women in terms of information sources that they can access and use mm -hmm. or prefer to access. Um, but some things would change, particularly um, as you change sort of dominant religions or uh, um, sort of again, things like cell phone connectivity is really terrible in Papua New Guinea. And so you don't see mobile devices being quite important information yeah. sources, but they would be in some, in some parts of Africa, which um, the SMS and technology has been critical to providing um, agricultural information. So um, I imagine that it would depend, but there would be some interesting parallels across context and so if anyone wants to do any studies um, it'd be really cool to <laughs> well, do we're some... doing something similar but we're doing it just on a different subject but we are looking at you know looking at that comparative analysis across the different countries across southeast asia and seeing what the differences are between um, the roles of women in managing um, plant pests um, and disease for example and in, in maize crops so um, it's really interesting to explore that though further i think because i think it could be quite context specific depending on all those different um, cultures and values we've got quite a few questions here there's an interesting one here around in fact they're all good questions so thank you very much around does the 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 way that farmers are approached and also who are approached for agricultural extension services or even researchers do is the way that they approach or if they just approach male farmers does that influence the difference differences in that source of information or the direction of that information afterwards? Um, I would imagine. So the extension services are quite limited in Papua New Guinea, mm -hmm. um, but they do tend to target 
a very small number of primarily male farmers. And so um, that the sort of tendency for those um, entities to be sources for male farmers is like most likely a construct of who the extension agents are targeting to begin with. Yeah. Um, which is something to keep in, like to take on board as we, as we try to um, provide guidance on how to more equitably <laughs> provide information within this context. And um, we, when you go out and interview and do the survey work, I mean, survey work's always quite, quite a big part of the project, obviously, and quite mm. difficult sometimes. I mean, um, how do you think that who how you're surveying and also um, maybe the educational background of the different people that you're surveying is having an influence as well on 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 I guess <laughs> your results and then also how they communicate as well yeah yeah so um obviously the survey design can introduce biases and um also will and was it a challenge is it, it was did you find that challenging that survey component so so we partnered with um a social survey um organization within papua new guinea that's has quite a long long standing background in the country and so um it was actually conducted during covid so um the australian contingent wasn't there <laughs> in person because of <laughs> travel restrictions um yeah which definitely adds a, a level of complication. But um, the, the survey used, or well, female enumerators were the ones who interviewed female farmers okay. and male enumerators um, interviewed male farmers, which can, all, which can reduce some of the biases um, if say there is some uncomfortable um, relations between um, if, if say a woman's uncomfortable and responding to a man, a man who might be asked, answering questions. Um, just to note the education level and the, and because there were a couple questions and Allison, you just brought that up. Um, the so we also had information on education level and there is definitely a marked difference between male and female farmers in that respect. So women tend to have lower literacy than their male counterparts. And that that could um, affect how they, they responded. And also um, how they communicate going forward, yeah, I guess. Okay. Right. And so things like media might just not be accessible if you can't read. Yeah. Um, so that's something we're definitely taking on boards. Um, the print information is not going to be as useful for a lot of women farmers. And that's why sort of oral um, uh, provision of this information through things like church groups where they're, they're, okay. they're trusted entities. And when, um, when you talk about, um, you talked about the importance of legitimacy, sort of building that legitimacy mm -hmm. for sources for women. How did you think, I mean, thinking going forward, how, what are some of the ways we can build legitimacy? Yeah. Um, to, to build that trust. To, have you thought about that in relation to the climate services information, I guess? And yeah. So one of the thing our team, one of the things that our team has um, initiated since this survey has taken place um, has been a couple of community outreach activities, such as um, focus group discussions and farmer field days, where they are actively trying to build relationships with farmers rather than um, just, you know, throwing information at them. Yeah. And that can be quite important to building sort of a trusting relationship with information providers, you know, and the, these people will be providing information in the future. And so um, it, it uh, builds those, that social capital that I mentioned over time, rather than just expecting yeah. Um, there to be trust in the information implicitly yeah, and so yeah. I guess that's one way but a lot of that 
takes time. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. And, and just before we go, Rachel, and thank you so much for a fantastic presentation. Really interesting. And some people are wondering whether yeah, you are planning to do this work in other countries in the future. Um, what If you had to just be very quick and brief, what was the most surprising or one of the most surprising aspects of this work? Um, I mean, I guess I was really struck, struck by the, the stark contrast. I was expecting less, um, I was expecting more overlap in sources, but I think what's, what surprised a lot of us was actually just the dominance of the church, um, in something completely, what would I think of as unrelated, um, agricultural information, but, um, or well, climate and weather information, but a lot of respondents, not just women, but across the board, pointed to the church as an important source of climate and weather information. And so that just, I think that struck us as um, a really useful finding if we actually want to get information into the community mm -hmm. through a channel that exists already and is already well known and trusted. Yeah, so, no, definitely. That's, yeah. that's yeah, it's very interesting and very important information. So thank you so much, Rachel. If you can um, stay, there's a few questions on the, on the Q&A. If you can uh, have a go at answering those, that would be most appreciated. Uh, and I'm going to now introduce, Gomati, I see your hand is up. Is that because you wish to speak or ask a question? Um, I just wanted to um, comment on the public extension Yep. Um, operation that's happening. Um, I've, I've worked in a couple of projects in PNG as well. And uh, my experience coming from other countries where I've worked in Pakistan and, and in the Philippines and in Laos and Cambodia. So the experience of extension service as a communicating agent or a change agent, they, um, as an organization, as a public sector, also have limited resources and their own constraints. So in order to deliver information, the mode that they choose would be contacting the most influential person in the village who, who might be a village chief or who might be, um, you know, a, a large farmer who's got, you know, lots of hectares of land. So they they minimize, they they have to minimize their visits because of their, their constraints. So, so that inequity travels through in terms of how information access happens. So mm. I, I thought I should mention that because there was lots of, you know, chat coming through about it. No, Thank that's fantastic. No, thanks. No, I, I love it. Jump in, <laughs> put your hand up um, because I think that's really good and it's it's really useful because I know a lot of you have all actually worked in um, these countries as well. Um, I'm going to move on and you're, you're going to, Gamath, I'm, I'm really looking forward to your presentation, but feel free to keep in the chat there and keep the discussion going on this. Bethel, I'm going to introduce you now or I have already introduced you, but I just want to reintroduce you and say, I'm really looking forward to this presentation also. Um, I have done lots of um, work lately in this area and lot, run lots of biocontrol uh, type webinars. So this is something that's also dear to my heart. So I'm really looking forward to hearing you speak about trichogramma and um, the technology uptake uh, and of this biocontrol and gender analysis of that uh, related to communication. So you are welcome to start and um, good luck. Um, Not that you need it. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, can you see my screen well now? I can't, yep, perfect. Okay. As, uh, thank you, Alison. So I'm going to be presenting a gender analysis we did on the communication and uptake of uh, trichogramma to control tomato fruit border in Pakistan. Uh, <clears throat> just to start with the background, so tomato crop is a very important economic crop in Pakistan. Uh, it's mostly produced by small hunter farmers with the one to two uh, uh, hectares uh, lands, uh, one to two acres uh, land size, uh, and um, it's produced as a commercial crop. Uh, it also creates employment opportunity because the uh, post harvest process is uh, labor intensive. And the helicover by Nigera or tomato fruit border is a major pest affecting tomato crops in Pakistan, it causes 
uh, food loss from 32 to 54 um, percent. And farmers usually use uh, chemical pesticides to control the pests, uh, but excessive and indiscriminate use of pesticides that uh, promote a lot of negative consequences. Uh, it has created uh, uh, resistant insects. Uh, it has also uh, affected uh, the environment. Uh, there is a uh, residue of pesticides in uh, the tomato produce. It affects uh, farmers' health. Uh, so there has been a lot of study on alternative methods to control the pest. And uh, a lot of studies have been done on the use of trichogrammas, small, uh, small wasps. Uh, as a biocontrol agent to control the pest. Um, and it has been promoted by the Pakistan uh, Agriculture Department in Punjab. Uh, the department has set up uh, laboratories to produce trichogramma and distributed trichogramma egg cards free of charge to farmers. Uh, private sector organizations like uh, sugar cane uh, uh, meal, uh, meal factories have also, sugar meal factories have also uh, provided uh, eight cards free of charge to farmers. Uh, so there has been a lot of initiative around the promotion of this biocontrol agent. And now Kavi plans to start the scale up uh, the production dissemination of trichogramma in Punjab. So this study was done to understand the gender related barriers for the uptake of trichogramma uh, to control uh, this uh, tomato fruit border. Uh, and the study uh, looked at uh, the advantages and disadvantages for men and women in the process of the technology selection and the communication process, and also looked at the experiences of men and women farmers in using the technology and tried to understand the advantages and disadvantages for both. And these were the research questions. Uh, how does the biocontrol method affect men and women's time and labor? Uh, and how does existing gender division of labor uh, and time affect uptake of the technology by men and women farmers? Uh, how does the use of the biocontrol method affect assets and income uh, controlled by men and women farmers? And how does the existing access and control of assets uh, due to existing gender relationship uh, affect uptake by men and women farmers? The study was done in three provinces, in uh, Punjab, uh, KPK, and Sindh, uh, and uh, selected districts within these provinces. Then the reason for selecting the districts is because there has been previous initiative of promotion, uh, promoting uh, trichogramma, uh, and also these uh, districts are known for commercial production of tomatoes. And we used uh, qualitative uh, study, uh, uh, qualitative research methods, a uh, key informant interview was conducted with agriculture department staff and experts. Uh, these are mainly people who are involved in the selection of the technology running the biocontrol labs and also uh, extension staff involved in uh, communication to farmers, agriculture uh, officers and field assistants. And the questions uh, that were asked were related with the process of technology selection, how the communication was done, how targeting decisions are made and who are targeted in the communication and the training methods used to train men and women farmers. Uh, and then we had in-depth interview with farmers uh, who are users and non-users of the technology. Uh, most of the respondents were from Punjab and most of the respondents were women, so 40 women and 15 men participated uh, in the in-depth interview. And the questions focused on the knowledge and experience of farmers in using the technology, reasons for not using for those men users, uh, and also the process of intra-household decision-making uh, to uptake the technology, the impact of the technology on farmers' time, labor, and food availability, income, and assets. Then we had focus group discussions with farmers in uh, Punjab and KPK uh, who are engaged in uh, tomato production. And the aim of the focus group discussion was to understand the gender roles in tom tomato value chain, to understand the roles for it played by men and women in the household, in the production process, uh, and also to understand their different levels of access to inputs, technology, extension advisory services, uh, how decision making is done in the household on uh, agriculture production in general and how decisions on income are done uh, and also the control that men and women have over agricultural assets and the, uh, their time use. So
So these are findings from the focus group discussions. Uh, both men and women participate in tomato production activities. Women are involved from uh, nursery seedling, transplanting, sowing to harvesting and uh, post-harvest management processes. Uh, they don't usually participate in pest management uh, when chemical pesticides are used, but when biocontrol methods are used, they are involved. Uh, so for example, when trichogramma is used, they are involved in putting the egg carts in the field. Men participate in land preparation, irrigation, fertilizer application, uh, and they're also solely responsible for marketing of the produce. Uh, in SWAT, uh, the participation of women is limited. They don't participate as much in the production process. They participate somewhat in the post-harvest uh, management. Most of the activity is done by men. And uh, we looked at the uh, different uh, sources of information for men and women farmers, uh, for users. And uh, so women were able to participate in training on uh, the uh, on the promotion of the trichogramma uh, because uh, organizations such as CABI and FAO were involved uh, and hired um, uh, community mobilizers to make sure that women participated in the training. Uh, this didn't usually uh, this doesn't usually happen in the government extension system where most of the extension trainings are focused on men. Uh, so in this case, in Punjab, due to the support of uh, uh, this uh, non-government organizations, women farmers were involved in training. And uh, in addition to training, they uh, also learned by uh, sharing experiences and looking at practical demonstrations done by other farmers. So that was also an important source of learning for women farmers. Only one woman, uh, woman farmer learned it from a male member of the household who has been trained in Punjab. Uh, when you look at SIND and uh, KPK, uh, most of the women uh, heard about the uh, technology from male farmers in their household who have been trained or who have communicated with uh, agriculture extension agents. Uh, and in a few cases, uh, the agriculture experts working with sugar companies and uh, research, uh, agriculture research departments were responsible in sharing information to male farmers. <clears throat> So looking at the uh, use of trichogramma in Punjab, it was mostly used uh, to control tomato fruit water and tomato crops and uh, also in sugar cane crops. Uh, the biocontrol agent was obtained from the government uh, run laboratories through extension departments. It was free of charge. Uh, the current status is the supply is not reliable and farmers have resorted back to using insecticides. Insin has been <clears throat> mainly used for sugar cane and it was supplied by sugar mill factories. <clears throat> now the supply is no longer available. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, in KPK, <clears throat> uh, it was provided through uh, uh, an agriculture research uh, project. Uh, now the project has ended and the supply is no longer available. But in all the three cases, it was provided uh, free of charge. Uh, so looking at the intra household decision making, <clears throat> on use of uh, trichogramma, usually uh, women don't participate in decision making on uh, agriculture technologies. However, in Punjab, because uh, they were trained uh, in the bio, uh, on the biocontrol and also they uh, their labor was needed uh, in applying, 76% uh, of the women respondents said they have been consulted in the use of the technology. In SIND and KPK, the decision to use it was made by men in the household. <clears throat> Looking at the impact of the technology on women and men's time and labor, <clears throat> uh, women respondents said it mostly saved male labor, uh, a family and hired labor. And they said they used to uh, spray chemical pesticides from three to four times in a cropping season. Now that has reduced to once. Um, they said their role in pest management increased because they are responsible for putting trichogramma egg carts in the field, and this is done on a bi-weekly basis. Uh, and one fourth of the women respondents also say it reduced uh, health risk because even if uh, previously they were not involved in spraying chemical pesticides, they immediately go uh, after the chemicals are sprayed, they go to the field to do harvesting. 
and uh, their health was affected. <clears throat> Main respondents agreed that it takes less time to apply the egg cards compared to uh, chemical pesticides. They said they previously used to spray once a week. Uh, now they have reduced the frequency of spraying and also the number of the insecticides they use. Uh, but they say they still needed to use insecticides to control other pests that are not controlled by trichogramma. <clears throat> Regarding impact on uh, production and income, so the trichogramma was um, promoted along with other uh, practices like tunnel farming and improved uh, tomato seeds. Uh, and a combination of uh, all these uh, practices and technologies uh, led to reduced crop loss. 60% of the women respondents say it reduced crop loss. Uh, they improved the quality and yield of the tomato they produced. They had increased market level produ uh, produce, for example. Uh, they said, you know, previously they used to remove 20% of the fruit during sorting and grading because it is uh, spoiled by tomato fruit were, but now uh, that damaged fruit reduced to 5%. 42% uh, say they improved the, they, because of the improved quality of produce, they were able to get better price. Uh, and 23% say it reduced the cost of production because they don't use chemical pesticides as much. And they say it increased their profit from 10 to 20% compared to previous years. Um, however, 20 28% also said, you know, because of fluctuation of market prices uh, during peak production time, uh, it affected their profit. So prices can fall by about 70% during peak production season. <clears throat> Male respondents also agreed two, with two most minutes, of these results. Okay. But they gave a more conservative uh, uh, figure in terms of uh, increasing production. Uh, so regarding decision making, 38% uh, of women participated in allocation of money, uh, in the use of money from the tomato production. Uh, some 42% uh, say they didn't have any control, but that's as a result of um, uh, due to lack of education. So I'll just go to uh, the concluding remarks. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the thing is both the public extension and private organizations targeted male farmers in the technology communication, despite women's role in tomato production. Uh, and, but the initiatives uh, by, supported by Kabi and Theo used women community mobilizers and trained women farmers uh, and promoted the biocontrol method in combination with other good agronomy price, uh, practices. Uh, so um, the lessons from the study is that targeting women has advantage because trained women can influence decisions, even if you know, uh, usually decision on technology used in the household is made by men, it's more complicated. So when women have access to information and when they are directly trained, they can participate in decision-making. Uh, and women are also more supportive of biocontrol methods. And this is identified from the responses of both the users and the non-users. So targeting women is also, uh, can increase the likelihood of uptake and not targeting them would be a missed opportunity. Uh, and also be, women take face management roles when biocontrol methods are used and that training them will uh, increase the efficiency uh, of the extension communication. Um, the other thing is also uh, men and women's interest in the are a bit different. So women are more interested in the health benefits of the biocontrol method. So promotion messages that focus on health benefits are likely to resonate with men with women, and men are uh, more interested in the effectiveness of the biocontrol method <clears throat> and in comparison with chemical pesticides. Uh, so um, focusing on those kind of elements is, uh, would resonate more uh, with men farmers. So the recommendation is to target women directly <clears throat> in uh, plant health communication and to tailor communication messages for men and women farmers. Uh, also to ensure reliable supply of trichogramma parasit uh, parasitoids and combine that with extension advice. Um, and also <clears throat> to promote integrated biocontrol based pest management approach because of some of the challenges that farmers were facing. 
and <clears throat> and it's also good to promote the approach in, with a package of other good agronomic practices as seen in Punjab. Uh, and it would be important to support women to organize and engage in marketing so that they can have more control over income. Uh, at the moment, their labor and time uh, in production has increased, but uh, they're not able to make decisions on the money earned from sale of tomatoes. Uh, so it would be important to combine social norms, change interventions, uh, so that women can also have more say uh, in decision making about benefits from production games. Thank you, Alison. I'm sorry. For the, no, Bethel, no, don't, don't, don't apologize. Don't apologize. That was fantastic. No, you've just got so much information in there. Um, it's really interesting. It's always great to have an actual um, study like that where you've looked at all the benefits that flow through it and, and characterize those. I, I One question I've got here, it seems a bit of a shame that it seemed very successful and that you had many positive impacts on reducing pesticides um, reducing crop loss, you had better quality um, tomatoes, you had increases in profit, women were really mm -hmm. uptaking the technology more than, um, and were interested in it. Um, but it seems, am I correct, that now they can't access the trucker grammar. Is that right? I mean, why? Um, so the reason is that the supply is not reliable. Uh, the uh, private uh, sector mill companies that used to provide the uh, trichogramma uh, are no longer doing that in Sint. And in Punjab, it's done by government laboratories. Uh, and it's still supplied, but it's not um, available as needed, uh, mm -hmm. especially if more and more farmers want to use it, the supply is not. So it's not commercially available at the moment. It's produced yeah. by a few government labs in uh, laboratories in Punjab. And the uh, supply is not much. Uh, and in the other province, in KPK, uh, it was yeah. started through the support of the uh, uh, Rural Development Program. And that program ended some years ago. After that, uh, there hasn't been uh, any continuity. Uh, the supply has not continued. So there are different reasons. But the main reason is it's not yet commercially available. OK. OK. Um, now, I have, I think, your colleague um Sajila Khan from I I think you're at Kebby as well well I I understand hi, hi. yeah hi can <laughs> hi this is Sajila uh Sail Khan I'm the gender coordinator uh at Pakistan Asia Center I've just recently joined and Bethel good work <laughs> welcome I actually thank you very much I actually I belong to the area where Bethel actually presented uh, Swat KPK I'm from the Patan culture I just wanted to kind of um, uh, just say a little bit background of the Pakhtun women how why they don't get in much into you know to the to the public areas and uh, the government why is the government not kind of going into it mm -hmm. the the the, the Pathan culture the Pakhtun women from kp northern areas of pakistan which is on the border of afghanistan this area actually is a very restricted area for the women to come out and you know work in the fields uh, most of the women who work in the fields in all this province the kp province are uh, most of the time are either very poor families who are working on the lands or either they are the migrated Afghan families, very poor families who are actually working there um, kind of you know, on daily wages or, or they're kind of, you know, uh, a whole families working on those lands. So that's that's the biggest issue, actually, because the, the household women are due to the parda. Parda is actually that you don't come out in public and meet yeah. other men who are not of your family. So that's actually one of the elements that why the women, if they want to work outside on the, in their fields with their husbands, because of the social cultural setup, and how the you know the whole household uh, setup is uh, kind of um, controlled uh, by the men folk. The women cannot come and work in the field. So the field workers are usually very poor women who don't have kind of you know uh, anyone to kind of support them. So they're the one who working their fields. Or if the if the families are working together, there will be certain. Uh, uh, part of that whole value chain where the women will, if, if it's kind of a sorting or packing or something like that, that will be inside the premises of that house, you see. That yeah. will be not in the public area uh, because, again, the parda element comes that they should not be sitting in public areas. So that's one of the element in the KP side. 
where I'm just talking from the gender perspective. Uh, yeah. Bethel is expert in the the other the other part, but I was just kind of gender perspective. I wanted to kind of just share with the audience that this is how the KP area is uh, the women. And if you go to the Punjab, the Punjab north the, the southern side of Punjab is also the same. Men are very possessive and they don't want their women to come out and work in their field. Most of the women who come out will be the same Afghan migration, migrated refugees, families, poor families who will be working uh, on the land. So yeah. this is just I wanted to kind of share. Sajina. Thank you very much. Oh no, thank you, and thank you very much for joining, and and um, welcome to the to to the work and and working together. Um, fantastic to hear that perspective as well. I think it's it's very interesting, and it really drives home that importance of the context within each. Um, location within each culture is so important to understand. Um, you can't sort of take generalizations from from these projects and apply them, you know, across the whole region because every every culture has its differences and every location has differences. And um, so that's really good for you to highlight that. So thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. And one thing else, else, I wanted to share about. I mean, I always kind of stress on this that whenever there are project designers at the at the the, um, organization levels or at the government level, we need to be kind of first looking at the cultural setups of that particular area when you are going inside that particular for implementation of the project. You see, if yeah. if all the if all the things are looked at first, the situation analysis gathered from gender perspective, then you see we can design the program. Uh, according to that, and we can go for a workable approaches and go to kind of get into an entry, get get an entry point and get into that particular areas. And that's how it always is successful. And it's when whoever has applied that, it's always a success uh, stories for those people that they know which are the entry points. How can we go inside these communities? How can we motivate and mobilize the men communities to let us go to, towards the women and get them on, you know, on board? Excellent. Yeah, so that's it. Thank you very much. I will not take much time. Yeah, no, no, that much. was brilliant. And, and gomathy has got a hand up, but that's because um, I'm just, before you get into I'm yeah. also going to get you to share your screen. <laughs> Bethel, we'll, we'll have some questions. You've got some questions on the Q&A, I think. Um, and yeah. um, please ask Bethel some questions. I've actually got lots of questions for Bethel as well, but please ask them in the chat because we need to move on to gomathy and her presentation as well. And um, let's leave some space there. Gomathy, um, I'm I'm going to give it to you to load your um, yeah. presentation. Maybe while you're loading, you can multitask and respond at the same time. <laughs> yes, I can. Um, so thank, thank you, Sajila, for your um, uh, you know points in there. I, I'm thank working you. on a project thank in Pakistan you. as well. So one thing I would like to make a point here: um, there are comments on saying <clears throat> you know having women, more women extension officers. I just would like to, um, you know, make a point here because women extension officers also have to follow the gender norms. So mm. please do understand mm -hmm. having yeah. more extend female extension officers immediately will not resolve the problem. It's a, it's one step, but um, in my experience, when I when I met a lot of female extension officers, most of them were working in the labs um, rather than in the field. And that's mm -hmm. not just in Pakistan, but you could see that in many countries um, because of the gender constraint and problems that they're experiencing. Um, Very good point, Gomathy. And I think that's true. And I, I see some countries in Philippines, for example, that you're going to present. I see a lot of women extension um, and project people out there. Um, it, it, and But it, it doesn't necessarily always translate into um, huge empowerment for women farmers. Um, it does and it doesn't, so I'm not making any judgment there, but it's good to really dig further and sort of see how is that changing or empowering women farmers on the ground. Okay, so no introduction here. You're going to go straight into how do we unlock women's power by enhancing their communication skills. Go for it. Okay, um, so my presentation looks okay at your end? Yep, perfect. Okay. Okay, and I'm Gomati Palneapan from the University of Queensland in Australia. Um, I'm a senior research fellow at the School of Agriculture and Food Sciences. Um, and I've worked in many um, SEAR projects, um, which gives me um, interest to work closely with the community. And thanks for the opportunity for presenting today. So in my presentation to unlock, um, I'm, I'm going to 
approach this with two questions, uh, which Alison mentioned earlier. One is how do women farmers communicate differently to seek information, whether they are or not is something that I want to understand. The other is what might this mean? Or we just talked about designing projects. So while we design projects, these information need to be taken into consideration so that um, we can efficiently integrate women and see that the information and knowledge can be communicated. Now, um, I'm going to present a case study, which is from an ACR funded projects, which is developing vegetable and fruit value chains, integrating them with community development in the Southern Philippines. So this project was uh, between 2014 to 18, but we did work a bit earlier than that as well um, on, on this project. So let me see if I can change the screen. Well, yes, I can. Um, okay, so this project, we had three um, project regions um, in the Southern Philippines. One is the Davao region, where you could see here. And then the other is Cagayan Diario, um, which is the Northern Mindanao and later region, which is from the Eastern Visayas. So we had villages um, selected. So barangay here actually means villages. Um, and uh, in my next slide, you'll be able to see that. So in those three regions, we had these villages selected as intervention sites. And of course, being a Valishin project, the core theme of the project or the objective was to improve farmer families' livelihood, specifically smallholder farmer families' livelihoods by getting a better access to markets. So of course, when you go to farmer fields for any researcher, um, the major issue, if you could ask any smallholder farmers would be um, that I have not got a good price for the produce that I have produced. That is a universal problem that you would um, hear from farmers from Australia to farmers from the Philippines or anywhere in the world. Okay, so um, earlier in the project, we used um, household survey. We did a couple of methods um, because of the time constraint, I'm using only the baseline survey that we, the data from the baseline survey to discuss here, but um, we used um, a quantitative method of um, survey and then qualitative or focus group discussion. We also did social network analysis, but that was more like a participatory approach where farmers, uh, the male farmers and the female farmers were talking about um, who they thought uh, on where that information was coming from and who they trusted. Now there was, uh, the speakers did talk about trusted information from the um, farmers or the peers or within the community. I, I also find the same as well in my research, but as I learned, I also understand that we need to see if the information communicated from the peers is also a credible information because the credibility of the information can through the experiential knowledge with all due respect of farmers observations, um, there are information which is credible that passes on and also some information which is not credible. So we, we as researchers have to be quite cautious on that. Now, um, a total respondents, you could see with the respective villages, we try to aim um, around 30 to um, 40 farmers per site. But as you could see, um, you know, sometimes it's, it's more like an accidental sampling where we talked about how we um, train enumerators and then we send them through to the villages and collecting data. There's a lot of challenges with that. Um, and uh, many times you may not get the number of respondents that you think that you really want uh, for collecting that information. However, um, when you have good connections like um, social ties with the um, barangay captain who's an administrative officer uh, within the village, and then farmer cooperative leaders. There's, there's, it's common in, in the Philippines, in the villages, to have um, formal or informal farmer cooperatives. Um, so they, they, when, I, when, I, when I say informal, that they not necessarily be a registered farmer organization. So 
connecting and linking with them uh, that always allows you to um, engage with respondents as well um, in order to collect information. Now, moving on. Um, so here is a, a quick synopsis about a comparison of information seeking behavior of females and males in all three regions. However, as a research team, our assumption was, of course, males would be seeking more information compared to the females, but that assumption was wrong. You can see here that both the females and the males actually seek more information. It's very interesting in the Philippines. Um, before coming to the Philippines, I was working in PNG and it was very difficult to bring women um, women farmers for capacity building because of the of the cultural context in that country. Um, it's usually we have to go through the male farmers and whether the males are willingly, you know, allowing the women is becomes a big question. And then you have to keep on negotiating in order to have the women um, in, in, in your training. Surprisingly, in the Philippines, you would have more women attending the training compared to the male farmers. And you really have to make sure that the males are also attending the training because some of the, you know, when you when you understand gender roles, that there, there's, for example, integrated pest management or anything related to crop management, the decision comes from the males. So even if females attend the training, you won't see a bigger impact there. Um, and also I would like to share um, a very important quote that I, um, when I was running a workshop in PNG, one of the male farmer um, uh, said, so we, we talked about what is the dream that any women um, farmer in PNG will have. And that was the workshop. And I'm writing the paper that hasn't been published yet. And the male farmer there said, oh, women don't dream in our country. It's only we dream and we tell them what to do. Very surprising. But when we did the workshop, we had, you know, women farmers talking about the dreams, um, you know, so well. So, and of course that information was shared with the my farmer. So that's that's one of my interesting experiences. Um, okay, I'm sidetracking, let me focus. So a comparison of information seeking behavior of females and males in Kage and Diario. If you look at this, you could very well see that um, the technicians, fellow farmers and family members. So you have formal, information coming from the technicians. So when I mean technicians, it's both the public and private sector. So it could be, um, you know, um, pesticides or fertilizer companies, so you no know, sales representatives and also extension officers as well. Um, so in, in the Philippines, the norm of male um, technicians coming and conducting um, awareness or demonstration, there, there is not restrictions in these particular villages. I wouldn't um, say for the whole of Philippines, I'm gonna say exactly for the villages that I'm talking about. So which you can see the females being, um, you know, like to contact technicians, so family members and the fellow mom, fellow farmers. So they, there are informal um, sources of information, but also they, would like to get the former source of information. And you can see how those, it actually differs. You could see that the females showing more interest in um, collecting the formal information from the technicians. So that's an interesting finding as well. Um, if you look at um, Dawa region, uh, where the information seeking and the communication of um, farmers, you could see here that there's no mentioning of technicians and mainly because of lack of access of extension officers visiting those villages. It's not that they do not want to get, um, you know, formal source of information, but it's usually when it is absent, they try to manage by means of getting information from the fellow farmers and the family uh, members. Um, interestingly, in Leyte, you could see here, um, the information is also, there's addition to the other three, um, there's association leaders, which is the farmer group leaders that I was talking about earlier. Um, they also used to, um, you know, seek information through them. So the information, um, you know, it comes through as women have the self-esteem or the confidence to go and communicate to get that information. And you can see that very well 
um, in the Philippines. And the other point also which we collected information was about perceived health effects from the farm activities. So you could see here that the females um, are more uh, perceiving about uh, or worried about the health effects um, rather than the male members. Um, of course, in San Juan village, you could see both um, female and male equally concerned, expressing concern about the health effects. So they want to seek more um, trustful information um, in order to make sure that they are managing their crops in a better way, uh, which actually provides the whole team an opportunity to provide knowledge. So when we say that you know they are keen, they want to make sure that the health of the um, you know farmers and the rest of the committee members need to be protected. That's actually a great opportunity where um, a knowledge delivery can happen. So. The question of, you know, is it separate, like how the communication is differing from the female and the male? So it's not just the communication, but we need to also consider the sources of information. So which one the females are more comfortable with and um, how that information could be passed on in order to make the change of behavior is was very critical in the project. So when we improve the quality of the produce, so um, being a value chain project, um, we wanted to improve the quality of the produce so that they can get better markets. And uh, by means of improving the quality, one of the main things that we considered was safe use of chemicals in order to get the niche market. So which many of the farmers, I'm not talking about GAD or I'm not talking about um, you know um, any certification process here, but however, by means of following the safe use of chemicals, it benefited both the farmer families and also in the markets because um, they were able to communicate with the buyers on you know, how safely they, they've been um, using those chemicals and the quality of the product and the taste of the product, which changed, which is mostly um, vegetables like the capsicum, the lattice and the tomatoes, which we've been talking before. Um, coming to my um, last question on, and the last slide is about how we go about designing those projects. So definitely we need to have the cultural context understanding and how we can do that when we design project is, of course, there's literature review and other opportunities of you know, reading reports and understanding, but however, we also try to engage stakeholders who have you know, good experience and understanding about the farmers that we are going to work with. So conducting gender analysis is very critical in every project. And it's important to understand what would be the barriers of communication for women in particular. Um, I, in my experience, I tend to use participatory methods and participatory approach in the project. So this would allow um, not just the women researchers, but also the women um, farmers or women participants um, so that they could tell us what they need, how the message needs to come to them and who they think um, will be trustworthy so that they can talk to them. So for example, in the project, the case study that I was mentioning, when we conducted farmer field days, we used to definitely make sure that each farmer brought in their buddy because they talked about, you know, peer um, farmer families as the source of information and of course family members. And we did invite all technicians, so the extension officers or any private sector um, technicians who are used to, you know, provide information and knowledge. So um, they're definitely invited to activities which happens in the village, like uh, a demonstration or a field day which would um, build up that relationship and network for them to deliver information and knowledge. It's also important to understand as to whom women would prefer to communicate because uh, we do understand that the trust and the relationship is very important and understanding the stereotypes and gender related exclusion in communication that needs to be addressed in all projects. 
um, we also um, in in our feedback or focus group discussions, we did find that, especially in the context of the Philippines, in because they have farmer groups and farmer cooperatives, women uh, do not tend to come speak up in those groups. So, say for example, they make a decision as a as a farmer group, um, uh, you know, to to sell to a particular buyer or to use uh, some chemical to control a particular um, disease, they generally feel very shy and there's a lot of hesitance for them to actually communicate. And in one of the needs, they did mention that we would need um, training in order to communicate um, in such type of a setting. So building women's self-esteem to communicate with um, other actors in the chain, with farmer groups or a larger audience, or specifically to the other gender is very, very important. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity. And I'd like to have a good discussion. Kumathi, cool, thank you so much. Uh, extremely interesting. And um, I've got quite a few questions for you actually. <laughs> Um, because uh, th that's been really interesting. I know you've worked across lots of countries. You mentioned PNG, but Philippines, and you mentioned, I think, Pakistan before, probably some other countries, I'm sure. I think you may have been in Vietnam as well, if I'm, if I'm, so I'm interested in some of those things you talk about, for example, it's important to understand who women prefer to communicate uh, to. Have you seen, what, what, big differences between those countries that you've worked in? Yes, um, Alison, definitely. Um, well, specifically, when I talk about Pakistan, um, you could see that it's um, you. the women would prefer to be trained by female trainers, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's very important that you identify and train a person before you, you know, bring them to the field to train those women. It's, it's very difficult. We, we did try, but in the early stage of the project, there was no female trainers. And uh, they, they were female trainers, but they are also very hesitant to travel to the villages because those mm -hmm. um, cultural restrictions, you know, is everywhere. Um, so there was like, a, we, we had a, like a screen in between the male trainer and the female participants. And he had to... Um, try to explain and demonstrate things um, with the screen in between. That's that's really really hard. So mm. it's so we we need to understand. How, but we had to begin somewhere because that was early on the project. But then later yeah. on the project, we found female researchers who became confident and built trust with us to you know come with us in the field and train yeah, this women. Yeah, it's fascinating. It's fascinating the differences. Um, I, I've got another question here. You talked about it's really important to sort of understand what the stereotypes might be. Um, what are some of those, when you talk about stereotypes, what are some examples that you've seen of in this aspect in relation to gender and women's roles and men's roles? And what are some of those examples, maybe the diversity that you've seen across the countries that you've been working in? So one, one thing which I see universal is um, a stereotype of women are uh, shy mm -hmm. and, and not necessarily. As, as you actually closely start interacting with them, they're not. But that's kind of a stereotype and women speak softly and women speak respectfully, politely, you know, all, all those gender stereotypes <laughs> is, around, is around that woman and... Uh, and she feels so much pressure, like she really wants to say, whatever you, you talked about, it's not going to work here. That's what she wants to say, but she can't because it's all, you know, overpowered with all those characteristics as how women should be speaking. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm really, really uh, was surprised with those stereotypes in, in terms of communication and how forcefully some women can speak. I, I was really, really fascinated by yeah. seeing that like is the, fascinating yeah like in the third or the fourth like in the third year of the project you, know, you build so much relationship with them um they they come and speak wonderfully and lots of male farmers really appreciate that and, and then they they think it's it's not but it's not necessarily to be shy to say oh this is not working or this this is not right or how mm. things need to work 
so huge. that's excellent D just interestingly we were talking about i mean uh, I, I asked some questions in the chat before just about pesticide use and maybe the hidden roles because we often there, there's often a stereotype or a generalization that that it's men that apply um pesticides and i think bethel's going to come in here too <laughs> <laughs> but um and, and so men apply it in the field but then there's a lot of different roles uh around because i've heard of cases in cambodia where women are responsible for mixing the pesticides together to get them prepared because it's more a seen as more of that job as their role or they may be washing the clothes after farmers have applied the pesticides so they they come into it to uh, contact with it. Bethel gave an example, and I think she, it didn't go to the whole audience, um, Bethel, but it was that women are often in the fields quite soon after the pesticides have been used and therefore have quite a high exposure to them. Do you find that that as well, that it's, it, is there a generalization that's just men? Do, do you think there are lots of maybe other areas in pesticide use that women are coming into contact or playing a role in decision-making and use? So um, I do find, um, like I agree with what Bethel mentioned, it's very soon after spraying, women are there uh, doing harvesting or weeding or any crop management related activities. And um, I wanted to emphasize that we um, need to, like that's my learning, which I'm applying in um, the forthcoming projects. Um, we, we shouldn't generalize women um, as, as a whole, we yep. need to understand that they could be contractor labors, they could be daily wages labors, they could be, there's, there's different categories of them, which actually the, the level of um, risk that they are taking to get in the field um, is, is what factors in. Um, I, I haven't really identified other ways other than, you know, being a supporting role of the male member um, in, mixing chemicals. The other interesting in Laos and Cambodia that I found was women sit in the um, shops where they sell yep. the pesticides. So it's mostly the women and children sitting there. And also women are the ones who buy the chemicals or the males make yep. the decisions. Yeah, that's really important yeah. insight. No, that's really, that's really good to hear. Hey, thank you so much for your presentation. Another wonderful presentation. See, I told everyone it would be fantastic speakers. And so there's no surprise there. So um, a really good way to end it. Um, Bethel, did you want to say something or are you, are you good? Was there something hey. else you wanted to say? Uh, no, it's just that I uh, didn't manage to respond to the questions that were asked. There was one question about the uh, species. It was uh, Trichogramma chilonis uh, that was tried. And uh, regarding its effectiveness in field conditions, several studies have done have been done in Pakistan and it's effective in field condition, depending on the density of the Trichogramma A cards used. Uh, regarding the pesticide in Pakistan, uh, I have seen in other countries that women are involved in mixing pesticides. Uh, that's not the case in Pakistan. But however, you know, they go immediately to the field to yep. do the harvesting, the tomato harvesting, and they are easily exposed. And uh, the health benefit is something mentioned uh, only by women farmers. The male farmers didn't mention the health impact of the chemical pesticides. So it's a really important communication message yeah. um, to tailor to women farmers when we're communicating the, about the biocontrol method. Yeah, uh, no, just and uh, the other yeah. And the other question is: uh, women were more appreciative of the bio. Someone said. Uh, did you ask the women and men from the same household? No, they were asked from different households. And it's true, uh, we, the, most of the respondents were women. More, we had more women respondents than male respondents. And women were more appreciative of the biocontrol agent because of the health benefits. Uh, men were a bit skeptical and they were saying it doesn't give quick results or yeah. uh, you know, it's not effective compared to chemical pesticides. So it just Excellent. shows that women are more supportive of uh, biocontrol methods. Excellent, Be Bethel. Thanks, I and I I did note that because I I think I I think you had forty women amongst the fifty five farmers for individual and in interviews, but for the focus group discussions, you virtually had a fifty percent split, twenty four twenty four. So I was interested. 
but that's another that's for another discussion but I think that's an interesting um, part of the research that's quite interesting to unpick as well around how that might influence um, Rachel any last one one or two comments or you can say no because we, we're just going to have a quick summary from Leandra as well but if you'd like to Rachel you can wave your hand and, and unmute yourself I think I had my fair share at the beginning, <laughs> so I'll let you go. That's awesome. Thank you so much for the three speakers. I'm going to hand over to Leandra, and, and we've just got um, we, we've uh, got five minutes to go, Matthew. Yep, quick. Yeah, Alison, very quickly, there's one more segment of, um, you know, like uh, the farmer uh, group that we need to include. It's called service providers. Yep. These days, you could see farmers contracting service providers who may or may not live in the village who will be actually dealing with the pesticides, chemicals. And uh, that's a family that so far we haven't considered in, in my project for interviews, which needs attention. Yeah, well, actually, that's probably another whole webinar topic. Because and, and actually, I agree, that's not looked at. So let's save that for next year. <laughs> Because I think that's really important and it's often forgotten. I know there's a lot of service providers that are coming on. It'd be really interesting to look at um, around how they can transfer information as well. Um, so fascinating stuff. Really good. Um, so much rich, rich information. I'm going to hand it to Leandra. We're going to end sort of, we're ending sort of five minutes late, but that's okay. We'll just cross five minutes late, but not a problem because the discussion is fantastic. And I really like how you've jumped in and, and added more information. Leandra? Thank you, Alison. I'll try to be really quick, but um, yeah, I'd like, just like to summarize everything that was discussed today. Some really good um, informative presentations, uh, you know, that have highlighted why communication between gender is an important aspect to consider, especially when it comes to designing projects and programs uh, that can help train and educate farmers and how we can even unlock women's power through enhancing communication skills. Rachel, I really enjoyed your presentation on the importance of improving communication networks. Uh, the point that you mentioned about the delivery of climate science technology and information, you know, how it is often um, delivered to technology savvy farmers, that really hit the nail on the head because this is unfortunately a common uh, phenomenon that is often observed across various countries, um, which is why it is important to consider ways in which information can be ta tailored so that uh, we can effectively communicate to men and women farmers at all levels. Um, another thing that really got my attention and I'm sure everyone else's too was how networks can influence the spread of information and again how this differs between men and women. Um, you know how women love to talk and often uh, their conversations will happen in a social setting with people that, are, that they're most comfortable with whether it's at the household with friends and family women pharma groups, or even the church, as you mentioned, um, as they value interpersonal communications from informal sources. But they also do not always trust one another, which can be a barrier when sharing information. And um, I like the point that you mentioned where it is important to target or train women that are trusted and well regarded within the circle, who can then successfully deliver up-to-date information to other women within the community. Um, and I liked how this differed in the case of men, uh, where they prefer to get their information from, I'd like to call it uh, informed sources like the media or agricultural agencies like extension offices. So there is a very strong contrast there on information preferences between men and women. And it would be good to find a way to connect that formal source to informal one so that there can be a better spread of information across these networks. Um, just one last point that you covered was on how gender plays an important role in agriculture um, and how men and women have different and or varying roles and responsibilities and thus the types of challenges that they face would be different, especially when it comes to accessing, you know, any sort of anything to do with agriculture or within climatic information. And women are often hindered um, because of, uh, you know, their limited access to resources or, or control over income um, as a result of social or cultural norms. So it is important to tailor um, climate information services uh, that are suited to it, overcoming these barriers or challenges um, and accessible to both men and women. Uh, Bevel, an excellent presentation there on how communication can be used to improve the uptake of biocontrol and why researchers need to tailor technology or information 
to support the uptake of gender specific crop protection technologies suitable for both men and women farmers. Um, I like that you pointed out um, how, you know, it's a common observation that farmers prefer using insecticides and they often tend to overuse insecticides, which is why I do agree that we do need alternative strategies for the sustainable management of pests and diseases. Um, and it is also important that we understand how these control strategies can be effectively taken up by not just men farmers, but both men and women farmers. I like to angle at how you looked at how biocontrol affects men and women's time and labor and how the existing gender division uh, was affecting the uptake of biocontrol. So that was really good. And that is something that I think that we all need to consider uh, when developing effective pest management measures for um, men and women farmers. Um, I was also fascinated with how involved uh, women were with the uptake of trichogramma for biocontrol, but it was sad to see that the supply of trichogramma was either unreliable or stopped altogether. Um, Sajila, you made a very interesting point there on how in KB, in the KB area, women were hinted, uh, hindered in participating in tomato production activities because of gender and social norms. And this clearly shows how um, you know, gender roles and responsibilities, they further differ across communities and even across regions, um, which is why we need to look at these different provinces when we want to get more substantial information um, on gender impacts and how communication has a role to play in all of this. Um, from your results, Bethel, I was quite intrigued on how um, amongst the non-users, one of the main reasons why women were less likely to adopt biocontrol was related to their inability to uh, be involved in decision making on farming technologies, um, and they were also constrained in relation to education and training and had limited access to information. Um, but they were definitely, I liked how they were more open to adopting biocontrol in comparison to men under the right conditions. Just um, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Two, two many more seconds, uh, the, the Andrew. Um, yes, yeah, so I think I'll. Um, yes, yeah, so that was some really interesting information there, and going with the you know lovely presentation, another really great presentation um, on. I, I like that in the Philippines, uh, women are very much involved in a lot of the farming activities, and when you did mention um, how women were as equal as men when it came to accessing information. Um, there was something I thought about, which uh, we discussed in the, or we came about in the mango fruit fly uh, webinar, where women were the ones who were responsible for letting their husbands make the decision, uh, oh, sorry, letting their husbands know whether they can get into contractual farming or not. So it, it just shows like how the involvement of women in the Philippines. Um, and also I liked that you, got the inv women involved and you asked them how they would like the information to be delivered to them by whom so you got that information from them because I, I agree with you often more often than once women do find it hard to communicate in a group setting and uh, they will do so though if they're in a comfortable environment so I think that is another thing that we need to incorporate into any research uh, that we conduct going into the future so um, um Thank you. I hope I did a good job with summarizing that. I had a lot more to talk about, but I know we're running out of time. So uh, thank you, everybody. And thank you for attending this webinar. And I am looking forward to meeting some of you in person at the end of the conference um, on gender and IPM in okay. Vietnam. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Uh, very thorough summary and you've definitely listened to everything there and also actually there was so much um, rich information um, it would be great to spend further time which we will do um, in person in Vietnam if you're there but but there will be plenty of other opportunities because we can't all travel at the moment and be in the one place at very short notice opportunities next year um, this is the last of this series but next year we're going to be continuing on the discussion um, really interested in exploring other topics if you've got a topic that you want to discuss uh, if you've got an interesting project, if you've got an insight, and go, Matthew, you, you said sort of a story and you said I shouldn't sort of get distracted or, but I actually find the stories actually um, in those little bits of gems of like information really important to making sense in the space of what's happening. I think it really um, brings something. So thank you very much to all the speakers. Thank you to all of you who joined us today. Uh,
be safe everywhere, everyone, wherever you are, and um, be happy. And uh, look, um, we'll see you next time. And uh, thank you very much for participating. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone. It's great. <clears throat> thank you. Bye.